Welcome to the Metal Bob Live podcast. I am your host, Metal Bob. Today's show is brought to you by Legend Picks and also artist Jeremiah Kallick. You can find links to our sponsors and more at the Metal Bob Live website. There you can also find the latest Metal Bob gear, including shirts, hoodies, and more. On today's show, I had the honor of speaking with ex-guitarist John Love of Love Hate. We discuss Love Hate. We also talk John E. Love and the Haters and more. So sit back, have a listen, and enjoy the show. Thank you. All right, welcome to the Metal Bob Live podcast. My guest today is John Love. John, how's it going, buddy? Going good, Bob. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing great. So, hey, I was going to ask you. So, I know, I know you ended up choosing guitar as an instrument, but uh, I read somewhere that uh, originally you started out on the piano. Is that true? Yeah, I'm kind of mostly instrumental. I started on piano when I was six, which kind of gave me. Uh, the fundamentals of music and uh, and modality and everything. And I had an older brother and an older cousin that were guitar players. And so I uh, started playing bass before I even picked up a guitar after piano. And I wanted to be in a band with my older cousin. So I played bass for several years. And then when I turned about 14 or 15, I started playing guitar too. And that's when I went full time. But I mean, I play about 23, 24 different instruments. Um, not proficient. I mean, I probably guitar is my main instrument, but I mean, I play it. it I, I'm the kind of guy that if, if it makes sound, I'll figure out a way to make music out of it, you know? So, um, I don't play reed instruments though. One of my favorite instruments is actually the saxophone. I just never had the lift to do, uh, the reed instruments the way I felt like. So I have to rely on somebody else to perform those kind of things. But I've always been, uh, influence you know i've always studied multiple instruments and their tonality and everything within an orchestrated situation so not to get like long but i'm musically and and I, and I really love drums too i mean I'm, uh, drums are the foundation of everything so you don't have the right rhythm section it's hard to do what you think on top if you don't have the rhythm following you right so i mean what what made you settle on the guitar i mean it's your main instrument well, shit, I guess, um, to be perfectly honest with you, I always saw the guitar player had the better looking girl. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Nobody was noticing the bass players, so I kind of switched guitar so I could meet better looking girls. All right. How did, did it work out good for you? <laughs> well, it was also, it was a much more melodic instrument. You had two more strings. It's a different scale. And it's more of a lead instrument, a four-point instrument and rock and roll so it was kind of like a natural thing but i'm grateful that my parents you know forced me to do piano lessons when i was young and then i picked up bass to basically learn rhythm and incorporate that and then i just got into guitar because uh the girls were better on the guitar players arms than the bass players <laughs> <laughs> there you go right on. so that's I'll... when i was a young when i was a young sprout <laughs> trying to uh, you know impress the local girls so that's pretty much the reason probably how I went to guitar. That, plus, you know, it was just a more expensive instrument. Absolutely. So who were some of your uh, guitar heroes growing up? Um, mostly the Brit Explosion, but um, some Americans also. I mean, Jeff Beck is my number one, I think, well-rounded guitar player that I've been extremely influenced by. And then there's a lot of separations from that. I mean, between Page and uh, Townsend. Uh, all the way to the gamut of like uh, Robert Fripp, Adrian Ballou, uh, even Todd Rundgren. There's, there's so many influences. I listen to music as a, a backdrop and palette of my life. And so it's not just one genre that I, I listen to. I like to to see and, and be stimulated by different types of music. All right. So I got to ask, I know that... Uh... I know, I know Love Hate, you know, came about after this band. I was just kind of curious if you could give me a little insight on the Data Clan. Data Clan was the, uh, the band pre-Love Hate. And we were all high school friends and stuff. And uh, down in the South Bay in Los Angeles area, down by Palos Springs, 
Peninsula where I grew up. And it was just the uh, high school and early college buddies that we decided to create music in. We were right uh, when we started that was the pioneer of MIDI when MIDI came out and all the uh, uh, drum machines and MIDI keyboards where you could actually write music on a computer and start competing with these 80s bands, everything that was coming out in England and everything, Duran Duran bands like that, everything. They're using a lot of electronics. And so we were fortunate enough to have a situation where we could utilize that kind of gear. And that's what Data Clan was. Basically, Data Clan was, um, was a wannabe 80 band that really was the, uh, the preset of what Love Hate turned into. Playing with machines became, we became better musicians by playing to uh, regulated tempos and um, knowing if you were, it was never, you know, an argument about who sped up or slowed down because you're, you're playing to a click. And the machines actually honed us into better musicians. And then we got rhythm machines that kind of morphed into what Club A was about. More of a feel thing, not locked purposely to a click, which I believe sometimes if you don't play properly to it, it'll sterilize music. But we have a very strong MIDI early electronic keyboard background to Love Hate because we were into different styles of music. And we were, you know, like, like, uh, a number of other bands at the time, everybody's following the, the, the current, you know, this month's flavor. So we were searching a long time to find out who our di- identity was and really what we were about. It wasn't until we lost machines that we morphed into what Love, Be- Love Hate became. Now, Data Clan, you guys were a five piece then, correct? Data Clan was five piece, correct. We had a drummer. Uh, that we put on keyboards because he was the uh, Kaja Gugu looking, good looking kid with a nice haircut and a, you know, a pinup boy. So, but he was an incredible drummer and we put Joey on drums and we put uh, Rodney on the lineup because Rodney played keys or actually most of the time pretended to play keys because the sequences were doing most of it. But it was just the front light impact. We were competing with all the English bands, Duran Duran, the whole glam scene and everything. So I'm a little embarrassed with that particular part of our career but we were woodshedding we were still trying to find out who we were right so tell me uh i know you got a you know you got your own band now called johnny love and the haters is that something that's still we're going to still see something from here in the near future johnny love and the haters is just something i put together as a uh a taste of what it used to be like um i don't think Love Hate would be Love Hate without the four original members. And since it's just not possible to do that, I have some really excellent players that are good friends of mine. And we decided to do the catalog and just do a couple shows and um, to respect music and the albums. And we did a good job of it, but it's still not Love Hate. But Johnny Love and the Haters, it kind of extends more than that. I'm still writing and doing a lot of other things. Um, I've got a lot of people calling me and tell me, put out your solo record. Um, it's just... Financially, it's like uh, I'll probably end up doing. It. I've got it, I've got it written. I just need to finish it and actually commit. But um, financially, I'm not looking for any reward money wise. It's just something I need to get out of me. And yes, it will have influences of love hate in it. it. May not be just singing, but it will still have that vibe. Right. So I I seen I think I want to say it was 2012 that you guys did reunite for a show at the Key Club. Is that correct? That was 2007. Oh, it was 2007. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Been that, that, been that long, almost 14 years. Wow. We, uh, we did, that was the last time the full band played with all original members, um, at the, uh, knitting factory in Los Angeles. And it's a shame we didn't book a larger venue because we turned around and we turned, uh, about 1800 people away, but it was still over fire capacity and everything. And it was, I've got it on videotape. It was a great show. It was the real chemistry and the real energy of what that band was about. People grow up and people change and things, you know, people have different directions in their life. But I cherish that because I was concerned whether the band would still have the same chemistry and fire after several years of not playing together. And we came in and played, uh, everybody came to town. We rehearsed for two nights and we played that show. And it was just like, like 20 years before. Right. So, you know, and I know, I mean, I knew there was like some celebration of blackout, you know, a few years after that. Uh, is there any reason, I mean, why you guys weren't invited to do that show, them shows in the UK, or was it just something that 
you guys didn't want to do or how that worked? I'm not I'm not uh I'm not sure which particular show you're talking about. We did many, many UK tours over there. We actually even bigger in the UK, uh and parts of Europe than we were in America as far as like attendance and um excitement and press coverage. We were we were a, a pretty big sensation over there. The first two records were very well received. And uh, I got I, I don't know if you've ever been there, but the audience there just makes the uh, American audience look like they're puppets and like sedated. Right. So, yeah. I want to um, say this was like 2013. No, that's probably Jizzy. Okay. I was probably Jizzy out with some, uh, I, I promised myself I wouldn't talk bad about him, but I'm not too happy about him taking out B or C players to try to mimic their stuff and whoring the name. Right. So let's just leave it at that. That sounds hey, that's fine with me. So I, I yeah. will uh I will ask you so I my first experience with the band was oh gosh, it had to have been ooh I'm, early nineties, probably A C D C tour, I think, is when I first seen you guys perform live. Oh, you saw us on the Razor's Edge tour. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. uh-huh. What venue did you see us at? Would have been Cedar Rapids Five Season Center, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That was early in the tour. Yeah. Um, yeah, we started over in, um, in the East Coast, and uh, I believe it was Connecticut. Uh, um, no, no, actually, we started the first show at a venue. I can't believe exactly. I can't, can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was where they had actually set up their stage and rehearsed for a week before. And then we played two nights sold out there. And then we did the East Coast, and we worked our way over to the West. That was an incredible tour. We played in front of like 300,000 people in about a 10 week span and um, playing on a stage that side and all their stuff, their stage was in the hydraulics. So it was all underneath stage and we had the whole stage. It was almost like we were headlining and when we were playing with them. We couldn't go out on the ramps, but we were allowed, we had like four follow spots and the full light show except for their specials. And it was like we're almost headlining because they, and they were so generous. They didn't cut our, uh, our uh, main house power or anything, they weren't intimidated, like, you know, let's make the second band sound not as loud as us or anything. They were totally cool to us. It was a very corporate gig. Very, I mean, you get like 12, I, I believe it was the biggest uh, grossing tour of the year because the Stones didn't tour that year. But that was a huge tour coming from, we started with doing the Sheds and Theaters with Dio, and then we went right into the UK, um, I mean, into the uh, ACDC tour. And we hadn't even gone to the UK yet. And coming off of the UK tour with, um, I mean, I'm sorry, America tour with ACDC tour with the UK, the UK press had picked up on that and it just made our attendance even in the UK even larger. Um, being a two band bill with ACDC on the Razor's Edge tour, the biggest grossing tour of the year was definitely a feather in our cap. Yeah, absolutely. And I just remember the energy you guys put out was over the top. It sounded great. Uh, do you have any, what's some of your fondest memories of that tour, if you don't mind? Um, I gotta tell you, playing in front of that crowd, an ACDC crowd, was every bit as hard as playing in front of a Dio crowd when you're opening. Because you know they're there to see the headliners. And so you've got 30, 40 minutes to put on your show and hope to God you can win some of them over because I, I dodged a lot of spitballs and, um, whether they look like us or not. So, um, it's just, you know, side of the times, you're not the headliner and, uh, it was a tough, it was a tough, gig sometimes but you know it only made my band better well it became better because of the pressure well you know you guys you guys had your own sound as far as i'm concerned when you guys come out there wasn't really any anything another act like that at the time in my opinion no i mean well yes and no um of course we were influenced with by the gnr explosion and uh all the other local bands that were coming out we were signed kind of late in that period but we had honed our thing, and we all lived downtown. We're kind of isolated from Hollywood, which is different from other bands. And so you're right. We did have an identity. We weren't your typical L.A. strip band. We did have something a little bit different than that, and I think that's because of our uh, perseverance and um, and the actual environment where we had time to, to hone our craft and be ourselves and have an identity. And it just happened to turn to morph into what Love Hate became. Um, with all the machines before and everything, uh, I think everything had a purpose to get where we were at that time. And like, you know, like any record, it's just a snapshot 
of the band writing songs at the time. You go in the studio, you record it. It's just like a picture. That's a snapshot of the band at that time. And when we played live, even the songs, the way we recorded them at that time, we still were building on it to try to make them better even when we performed live. We were always wanted to be a good live band. And we wanted to be able to record music where we could um, we could portray it without a bunch of you know back backing tracks or bullshit or anything, and and be able to pull it off in an arena and it was big enough with a four piece band. That was a goal. I mean, we had that in, as a mindset when we were writing this stuff. Right. So yeah, and I'm, speaking of Dio, I know that you've toured with him several times actually because I've. That was my second encounter with you guys. I think it was Let's Rumble. You we guys... did four. Uh, we did four full tours with Dio, and uh, actually, uh, Niji Management managed us on the last three, or three and four uh, tours that we did with Dio before uh, Ronnie died. Mm -hmm. uh, Ronnie was a very big fan of my band, and he liked us from the beginning. He was good friends with Jizzy ever since uh, Jizzy uh, met him parking cars at some restaurant that Ronnie came to, and that's how they met when Jizzy was like about nineteen or twenty years old. And they always kept in touch. And when our band kind of came on the scene, Ronnie said, "Would you like to go on tour with us?" And it, we had a good relationship with him. And we went, we did four tours with him. Right. And uh, his wife, his ex-wife uh, Wendy, was managing us at the time also. We have a long history with Dio. Yeah, I'd gotten to see you guys actually. You were doing smaller. You were doing a smaller venue tour with him at the time. On and you, I think Let's Rumble was out. At that mm -hmm. time, so yeah, I've seen that tour. That was that would great. probably about that probably be the third tour we did. We did a tour with him with a blackout. We did a tour with Wasted. We did a tour with uh, uh, Let's Rumble, and we also did one. Um, uh, I'm not happy. Um, right. But um, I got to tell you, Ronnie, on our very first tour, I'm probably alive today to talk to you because Ronnie set me down and said, "Look, kid, you know, um, there's a lot of." things on the road that you can get in trouble with if you don't have any discipline. And he set me down and kind of educated me how to survive on the road. So, I mean, I kind of feel I have a very strong bond from Ronnie, from somebody of that stature to, to deliver that uh, kind of advice and, and try to steer me from being a statistic of some idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess when Ronnie, um, when Ronnie sits you down and talks to you, I guess you got to listen, right? Pretty much, yeah, you know. Ronnie says he wants to talk to you for a second in his dressing room. And I went in there and he gave me the fucking whole spit. And I'm like, okay, all right. Changed my life. That's great. You know? Yeah. That's killer. So do you, do you have a favorite original song to, that you play live? Any, anything that sticks out? That's one of your favorite songs to play live. Oh, you mean through the love hate catalog? Uh, anything. I mean, any, anything original that, that you, that you had your hand in playing live. Well, I'm very fond of a song I did with Thomas Bowlby on his Astronaut Heretics record, a song called Living in a Suitcase. Okay. And there was only five guitar players on that record. It was uh, Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir from Grateful Dead, Eddie Van Halen, uh, me and uh, Thomas Fusman Sanchez, who was the guy that was in fame. And I met Thomas at NRG Studios, a studio that we used to use a lot to record at within our... Um, the owner is one of my best friends up in North Hollywood. And he introduced me to Thomas and I ended up playing on that record. And I did a couple other things with Thomas for DreamWorks uh, films. And um, I was actually a guitar player in the uh, Sega Genesis, Genesis game called Double Switch, where Thomas got me in that with Blondie, uh, Deborah Harry, and, um, and a bunch of other big star people. And um, I had... I had such a good time because I was there when Eddie cut this song too, and then I got to go in after him and playing on a record with those kind of people was really kind of a nice, nice feeling that I was actually even considered to play with people that legacies and that kind of you know rapport. Nice. Um, just a couple other things. Um, I, I, I'm a producer as well, so I produce a lot of bands, people bands that people pretty pretty much don't know probably because they're not popular, but I I have a good ear and that's what I like doing. I like finding other talent also to maybe mold them and take them to the next level. And I've been working with a lot of uh, really talented younger kids in Los Angeles area. Um, one is uh, particular is Jacob Stibby. He's a kid out of um, Ukaipa and he's a house guitar player for uh, America's Got Talent. And I've been kind of 
being his big brother and mentoring him for the last three and a half years, and I've seen this kid just explode. Right on. So you uh, do you want to tell people why I got you on here, where where they can get a hold of you, if as far as uh, they pr- you're producing and all uh, that kind of well, stuff. Well. You can always go to, you know, John Love on Facebook. I'm the only guy that, um, you know, has a guitar in his picture, so you probably be able to find it. I, I dropped the E. My middle name is Eric. It's John E. Period Love. But I just dropped the E because a couple of people said just, you know, go with the John Love. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it wasn't taken. So uh, um, you can get me through there, or uh, you probably get me through my management Um which is Jeff Roberts. I don't have a number for him right now, but the best thing to do is just hit me up on Messenger or something on Facebook. Okay. I'm always looking for new talent. I'm always looking for new bands. Um, I'm going to be going to the East Coast to work with some bands um, and a partner of mine um, uh, for a couple months, possibly, if the pandemic comes down this summer. So I'll be on both sides of the coast. So I'll be in Maryland possibly for about two months this summer if everything works out right. But then I'm, I'm stationed in LA, live in LA. I have my own studio up North of LA. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to promote? You got uh, any other websites or, you know, no, Bobby, you're the interviewer, you know, bro. I mean, I'm just like hanging in there like everybody else in the world. We're like living day by day. Um, I got to tell you, I never, you know, Things are strange. I haven't been in this territory the way everything is, you right. know? Yeah, absolutely. I just wish uh, things could get a little normalized and we can all try to, like, put together a common sense and try to fix this with the best ability. And I don't even want to go into politics, but that has a lot to do with it also and the way people, their, their beliefs are and their thoughts. Right. Um, I don't even want to go there. Uh, I'm a father. I have children. I'd like to leave this world to somebody that can live in it properly. And uh, I guess the last thing is, if you're a love-hate fan, I appreciate your support. And um, it's coming. There's more from Johnny Love. Just, uh, you know, hit the fucking normal links. Type in my name. I'll probably still release it as John E. Love. So type in that. You might find something new pretty soon. That's awesome, man. Well, I appreciate your time tonight, brother. I really do. Okay, brother, I've got new stuff coming up. I've got these cats that I'm working with and everybody's in the pandemic, but I've got some new music I'm ready to release. It's just i got to wait till it's finished. Well, when it's going to be something, I'll, be, I'll contact you when I have something for you to play, all right? That'd be great, man. It'd be great to have you back on in the all future, right? brother. You take care of yourself, man. Appreciate you. All right, Bobby. God bless you. You too. Have Bye. a good night, brother. Bye-bye. Good job, brother. That concludes today's episode of the Metal Bob Live podcast. Please see our website for our sponsor links. Thank you for listening. Metal Bob out.